Welcome back to Battleship Systems. Battleships have more protection than any other naval vessel, but that protection makes it hard to see what's going on outside. The very few places that can observe relay information to indicators throughout the ship. In this episode, we look at some of the common fire control indicators you will see on battleships. We'll also go over what this thing is. We won't be covering indicators integrated with other instruments, just the sole transmitter and indicator. Battleship fire control is an evolution, and great ideas can become outdated very quickly due to wartime innovations. The Navy was always experimenting with better technology to take advantage of the 16-inch guns, and those experiments were carried out on the ships that carried them. When you visit a battleship museum, you are seeing one stage of that evolution frozen in time. Let's start with the most simple aspect of fire control. You've detected an enemy, now you need to let others on your ship know where it is. This is known as target designation, and historically, this would have been done with target designation transmitters. This is a target designation transmitter up on the secondary battery control. You would mount your binoculars in this device and then point it at the target. The transmitters have synchros in them that relay train and elevation to the secondary battery directors so they can find and lock on to the target you're looking at. The directors follow the target and send accurate bearing, range, and sometime elevation to plot. Obviously train and elevation would be helpful when firing at aircraft targets. But what about the main battery, where elevation doesn't matter? The designation process started with transmitters on the bridge or in the conning tower, depending on battle conditions. This train designation signal was first sent to the fire control tower. We'll get into how this makes its way up to the aloft directors in another episode. The signal was also sent to a couple train and elevation designators in plot, and in front of every target designator transmitter in sky control. They could have used the transmitter of whichever sector the target was in to designate the same target for the secondary battery. Designating a target by bearing is great, but to launch a projectile at it, we need to know how far away it is. North Carolina had two 12-foot rangefinders that would also receive these target designations. The operators would then get the target in the rangefinder sights and call out the range over sound powered phones. How long do you think these things lasted? This is how the commands made it to the guns. The captain gave his commands to the gunnery officer. The gunnery officer was in charge of the directors. The directors were in charge of plot, and plot was in charge of the guns. Radar wasn't really used much in the early days. But later advancements in radar came higher frequencies, which meant you could get more accurate target bearings and range without having to use optical instruments. Battleships were retrofitted with two SG radars, and with that came a combat information center. CIC was in charge of the radars, and they could detect and designate targets up to 40,000 yards away. This became integral to the fire control process and resulted in some changes to the designation circuits. The SG radar operator would find a target and crank its bearing and range into transmitters, which sent these values directly to the main battery directors. The range indicator Mark II displays a value from 0 to 100,000 yards, which is well beyond the range of the 16-inch guns. Let's see how it works. So on the top you have a light well, and you unscrew it, you have lights. And this lights up the dial. Now the red arrow indicates the point of the dial that represents the range the repeater is showing. It also has a red light and a green light. And those aren't Christmas lights. Those tell you which designation circuit the range indicator is showing. A lot of times green would mean the forward SG radar and red could be the after SG radar. 
as you can see, the scale is not very accurate, but the SG radar itself is only accurate within 200 yards. That's good enough for a designation circuit, and it's the director's job to find the actual range. If you're thinking this thing looks an awful lot like the target designators from earlier, you're right. The Navy used the design for many different things. The main battery directors also have a bearing indicator marked 10, but it's so small it's hard to tell what's going on. So we'll look at this bigger Mark 7 bearing indicator. The inner dial is the own ship's course received from the gyro compass. The ring labeled target bearing displays the bearing value. So if you want to get the true target bearing, you would read where the arrow meets the inner dial. To get relative target bearing, you would read where the arrow meets the outer dial. You would see these bearing indicators all throughout the ship. One of the things we can do when we have a target designated is order the guns to fire on it. But the guns can't figure out how to hit the target by themselves. We need actual bearing, actual range, and the speed and course of the target. Historically, meaning before the battleship North Carolina, this information would be calculated and sent to the guns so that they can, number one, elevate the guns so the projectile will reach the target, also known as sight angle, and number two, determine how far right or left of the line of sight to train the guns so the projectile will land on the target when the projectile lands, also known as deflection. This information came from what were known as battle order indicators. This is a concept left over from the days before plotting rooms and mechanical computers. For example, when the battleship Texas was launched in the early 1900s, the turrets would use their own optics to track the target. Subcentral would receive range from the fire control station and they would calculate deflection based on target movement, ship movement, and drift. These values of range and deflection were entered into battle order transmitters and electrically relayed to the turrets through the battle order indicators. You don't get a parallax correction, you can't tell the turrets where or how fast the target is moving, and the whole process resulted in slow manual calculations. Nevertheless, the North Carolina and the South Dakota classes had them. However, there are no battle order indicators on Iowa-class battleships. On the bottom are range and deflection, which are transmitted from the range keepers. On top is the battle order and control order. The control order lets the turret know who should be controlling the turret. The signs are local, indicating, and auto. We'll talk more about those when we go over range keepers. The battle order can be fire or cease. Both orders have a circuit broken sign to let you know when the indicator is not connected. The control and battle orders are transmitted from switches on the range keeper. There is also a plot ready signal to let the turrets know a solution is available. So now that the directors are facing the target, how do we get the bearing from the directors? We can get a course director train from the director train indicators. For the secondary battery directors, there is also a multiple director train indicator, which shows you where all four of your directors are facing. We need a lot more accuracy than this for fire control. The director transmits a coarse and fine director train. The plotting room can display both of these values on their bearing indicators mounted near the range keepers. The range keeper itself also uses coarse and fine director train. But how do we get range from the directors? Let's start with the old way. The directors had an optical range finder that allowed operators to find the range to any target. They would look into the eyepieces and move the range knob until the two images of the target combine. The range was then displayed on a window. The range finder had synchros that automatically sent this value to plot, but that's not something you want to display on any indicators. You see, range finders are accurate. Humans are not. The human brain has a tendency to create a single perceived image, something known as binocular fusion. 
This results in the two images merging prematurely, resulting in the wrong range being shown. To overcome this, the rangefinder operator would periodically look away and adjust the range knob while on target. Using a technique known as rocking the range, they would periodically move the range knob back and forth where one of the images appear to jump. Where that jumping stops is the actual range. If someone were to tie an indicator to this knob, you would just see back and forth action instead of the actual range. To get an accurate representation of range, they used to have these range receivers in plot. A spool of paper was driven through the unit at a constant speed. The range finders from the turrets and the main battery directors would all feed into this receiver. When someone pushed the mark button on a range finder, meaning they had the correct range, the range receiver printed a number on the paper representing that range finder station. The location of that number will be based on the range scale. The operator then found the mean values of these marks and that became what they considered accurate range. By the way, I know some of you play warship games where you see a third person view of ships fighting each other. Nobody would ever see that in real life. The most the crew could see was an indication on a dial, a mark on a piece of paper, a view of the target through a telescope, or a blip on the radar if you're lucky. Would you still play these warship games if all you could see is realistic indications from inside a ship? Let us know in the comment section below, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Now for the new way, using radar to get the range. The main battery fire control radar antenna sits on top of the director and points at the target. Instead of looking at the target through a telescope, they look at it through the radar screen. A range crank moves a dotted line on the radar screen up and down. If you set it right below the target, the radar equipment tells you the exact range. Pretty simple. No more rocking the range, no more evaluating multiple rangefinders, and best of all, this gives us a new fire control indicator. The range indicator marks six. The dials indicate the range accurately up to 72,000 yards. And similar to the range indicators are these handy bearing and range indicators that show the director's train and radar range. Now that we have indicators showing where our target is, how do we know where the guns are pointed? The range keepers or computers in plot send out train and elevation signals to the turrets or mounts. But how do we know that those mounts are following those orders? Furthermore, how did the crew inside a heavily armored 16 inch turret know which direction the turret is pointed? Battleships have these multiple turret train indicators to solve this problem. You will see these in every turret, but there are probably very few people who know how they really work. The ones in plot and the fire control tower display all three turrets. The dials on the left have turret figures inside of a dial with bearing marks. A lot of people think that that shows where the turrets are pointed, but that's not exactly the case. They display something called Modified Turret Train Response. You see, since the guns are placed in different locations on the center line of the ship, to hit a target you need to slightly offset your orders using what is known as a parallax correction. We've talked about this before in Fundamentals of Fire Control 2, but the point is the parallax correction varies by turret. If we were to look at the actual train response, none of them would match the orders. So we remove that correction and get modified train response and display that on the indicators. Now the dial on the right is even more enigmatic. It's a fine dial, meaning one revolution represents 10 degrees of train. So when the turret moves, the entire synchro rotates with it. But when the order moves, the synchro's value changes. So the idea is to keep the orders to match the values. If you remember back to synchro theory, this sets up what is known as a zero reader dial. This is how the multiple turret train indicator should look when every turret is following its orders. 
all the zero readers are pointing straight up at zero. There are a few downsides to this approach, however. One is that it's really hard to tell how far off you are. For example, is turret 3 off by 9 degrees and 20 minutes, or is it off the other direction by 40 minutes? Also, it's theoretically possible for a turret to be off by 10 degrees and still show as on target, although this is highly unlikely. You may have also noticed the yellow and red sectors on the dials. These indicate zones that a turret should not fire in because it may damage part of the ship. It's always nice when your turrets aren't destroying your own ship. In lieu of donations to me, please consider donating to a battleship museum like the Battleship Texas. There's a link in the description that'll bring you to the Battleship Texas Foundation website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Thanks for watching.